There are some definite tax advantages. Obviously, anything I buy to help maintain that property, like I have to pay the lawn care to mow that investment property, that would be a, um, a something I could deduct as a business because it's a lawn care. The other thing which we have talked about, remember depreciation, the straight line depreciation, an investment property will depreciate. And for the sake of this example, let's say that the pre depreciation is $10,000 per year. This is one of the examples we did earlier. Here's, watch this, this is cool. So let's say you've got a rental property and you charge $800 a month for it times 12 months means you made $9,600 in income, but your depreciation is 10,000. So you get to write off that depreciation, which in essence you will see is more deductions than income. You actually report to the IRS or you actually pay gains on zero dollars because it looks like you made nothing in this deal because your property lost ten thousand dollars and you gained ninety six hundred you actually lost four hundred dollars that you don't even get to claim because you didn't make it so the depreciation is a good tax benefit that allows you to not have to pay income tax on that property. Now, the downside is there are capital gains and capital gains for this class is just going to be defined as the profit. Let's go back to the one that I sold a minute ago. Told you I sold it for 280, but I paid 216, or no, actually I think I said I paid 214 so my capital gains was $66,000. That was the example we did a minute ago to figure the returns. Now, the problem with investment property, if you think back to that uh, tax deduction thing where we talked about, well, if you're single, you get 250. And if you're married, you get 500. What was the other half of that? you had to live there two out of five years. Well, unfortunately, it was an investment property, so that didn't happen. You do not get those benefits on investment property. Even though I made under the 250, I didn't live there two out of five. So now the IRS says, well, that is what they call a non-owner occupied investment property. I will pay capital gains tax on every dollar I earn. My business partner called Uncle Sam is going to want his percentage of that profit that I make. And that profit is either going to be a short-term capital gain, means I own the property for less than one year, or it's going to be a long-term property gain, which is greater than one year. If it is a short-term capital gain, this money will be taxed just like ordinary income. Whatever my tax level is, it is no different than if I went to McDonald's and got a job and made 66 grand, they're going to tax me at my tax level. So if you buy a house in January and you flip it and in May and make 66 grand, that is less than one year, you're going to pay capital gains tax just like it was a job. If the property you held for greater than one year, you are going to pay the long-term capital gains tax, which right now is 15% at the federal level you still would pay state level. And Indiana is one of the cheapest 
you would end up paying about 22 percent uh, by the time you get done paying the federal level of 15. And I think this is like oh, it's like 6.1 or something like that for the state. So you definitely want to make sure that if you're going to sell an investment property, you might want to make sure that you've held it at least one year because this could drastically change your tax outcome based upon how long you have held the property. Now, there is something else. Um, did we, it's not even in here. I want to talk about real quick while we're in this investment section. Is this thing called a 1031 tax deferred exchange? A lot of times you just hear it called an exchange. I've heard people say a tax-free exchange. That's not correct. It's tax deferred exchange. Because really what happens is you're not selling the property. You're exchanging it. And when you exchange it, you must exchange it for what the IRS calls like-kind property. So, question for this chapter. Do I have or can I exchange my fourplex with someone else's strip center? Is that considered like-kind property? The answer is most certainly yes. There is a big misconception that like-kind means I've got to exchange my fourplex for another fourplex. No. The IRS says like-kind means investment property for investment property. I cannot change my fourplex or exchange my fourplex with you and your airplane. No, one's investment property, one's personal property. I can't exchange my fourplex for a new house to live in in Florida. No, one's investment property, one is owner-occupied property. I can't exchange my fourplex for a business that you own. No. One is business property, one is investment property. I can exchange my single family home for a 10 unit apartment building. As long, let me back up. As long as I'm using that single family home as a rental property, all right? Not my personal, but I own another single family home that I rent out. I can exchange that for a 10 unit apartment because those are both investment grade properties. That's what like kind means. Now, there's a difference in value. My house may be only worth 225 and that 10 unit may be worth 800. Well, you and I as the owners have to balance out the equation monetarily, but the IRS doesn't really care about that. That is left to our own devices. And if I exchange my property, the jargon is I got to go sideways or up. Meaning if I have a hundred, what I say, 225, I got to exchange for a property that's at least 225 or more. And we would balance out those numbers in the exchange of either more money or something. And that thing that equals us out, they call that boot. We have to settle up on boot. Most of the time, that boot may be more money. I have to give you another 600000 and my house to equal your 10 units. That is worth 800 okay? This is a very complex situation. Real University teaches several courses that are four and five hours in length expressly just on this concept. And as an agent, there are many things you have to do to make this valid. So I would suggest if any of your investor clients start talking about an exchange, you better seek some help 
usually a good place to start would be the title company because they have an attorney on staff that would help guide you or obviously come back to us and take one of our courses. Because for instance, one of the things, when you list that property for sale, you have to list from the get go that it's going to be an exchange. If you fail to do that, you may disqualify your seller to be able to use the 1031. So don't mess that up. And that's what I'm saying. It is very complex. Now, there are disadvantages to investment property. The biggest one being this thing called the lack of liquidity. I know many friends that are millionaires on paper, but had to borrow money for lunch because to be able to get to that money, they would have to sell that property and selling a property could take a couple days. Well, a couple days may not seem like a long time unless you needed that money to buy your family food today. And what's worse, that house or that investment property may never sell. It may be on the market a long, long time. Remember, these are specialty properties. Very few buyers are going to come in and want to buy a 10 unit, $800,000 investment property. It is not like trying to sell a mom and pop house. So it's potential that that sale of that property to get to your equity or get to my cash, maybe several years in the making, definitely easily several months in the making. Another disadvantage that people have is the active management requirement. Dude, I got to be a landlord. I got to go clean toilets. I got to go mow the lawn. I got to go fix the hole in the wall that the uh, spouse and the couple was arguing. And then there's this thing, just the, in, the potential risk. There are people that are risk adverse. My wife is not a big fan of rental property. She, it just eats away at her the fact that there is a risk of all this money that could go down the drain. <laughs> but I'm not better. Now, two more things before we call it a day on this chapter. And these two are very similar in nature. They have to do with investors and potentially fraudulent developers trying to con people, or actually maybe they're not developers at all. They're just trying to con people. The first one is called the Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. It requires the developer submit a report to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the report has to do with what this property, where is it located? How is it situated to shopping and all of the other community? And it deals with the sale of unapproved lots across state lines. Once again, there's that prefix inter means between. So interstate, if somebody is going to retire from Minnesota and they want to buy this property in Arizona and build a big house on it, that would be an example. It is across state lines and the lot is vacant currently in Arizona that developer would have to file this report with HUD so that the people in Minnesota have an idea and that it is truly not a scam. Now, this report is exempt if the developer is only selling a few lots, like less than 25. My guess is because this report is financially prohibitive, if you're only selling a lot or two, it is probably too restrictive to make a profit. 
or if those lots are not less than 20 acres in size. Well, that sounds confusing. Basically, what I'm saying is if the lots are greater than 20 acres, this report also doesn't have to be filed, mainly because lots that are 20 acres in size usually are not construed as residential lots. That is farmland or recreation land or hunting land. And this does not cover this. This only covers unimproved residential lots sold across state lines. That is the Interstate Land Sales Disclosure Act. Some states use this thing called the State Subdivided Land Sales Law. This is virtually the same concept, only it deals with in-state sales. If the state regulates the land that is held within the border of their state, these tend to be a little more stricter and may not have these exemptions that are up there. All right. So that is the chapter that deals with the zoning laws. And we threw some investment stuff in there. I guarantee if it were I, I would understand those three changes like the non-conforming versus the conditional use versus the variant. Understand the occupancy. The certificate of occupancy is for residential properties. I definitely know there's some math questions that deal with the rate of return and calculating how much is returned on that. Um, these all can be practiced right down here. Just go here, do what you're supposed to do and do the practice questions at the end of this online section. You could also do uh, practice questions at the end of the ebook that you have got. And you can also think about this. Use chat GPT to create questions that you could practice on. We do have a book, if you're interested, that will help you. We've actually built some of the prompts to help you pass the state exam by using chat GPT. You can check that out in our library. As always, do I need to repeat my email address? It is Raymond at realuniversity.com. Feel free to reach out to me if you have a question and I will see you next chapter. Have a great time.